Well, let's go ahead and get started, everyone. My name is Melissa Martin. I am with ATS Lab Midwest. We will be hosting today's webinar all about ESSER funds uh, for career and technical education. We're really excited for uh, the program that we have for you today. We've got an incredible lineup of guest speakers today. Um, throughout our afternoon, both from the consultation side as well as from the education side. We have a couple of superintendents, a principal, um, and some of our own team here to share best practices and what we know about ESSER funds. Our goal today is to give you clear, actionable understanding of ESSER funds um, as it relates specifically to career and technical education programs so that you can take advantage of just this incredible once in a lifetime, you'll hear that more than once today, once in a lifetime opportunity um, that can benefit your district, your students, and overall our communities. So to get us started, I am thrilled to introduce Matt Kirkner. He is the president of ATS Lab Midwest, as well as the host of the uh, Tech Ed podcast. Now, Matt spent his entire career running manufacturing companies and came over to the education side about six years ago on a mission to secure the American dream uh, for the next generation of STEM and workforce talent. That's what Matt's whole mission is about. That's what he's dedicated his life to. So he has incredible insights on all things education and as it relates to the workforce and industry. So here's Matt to kick us off. Well, thank you, Melissa. And what a pleasure it is to be with all of you today. This is a really, really important topic. And I'm going to talk just a little bit as we tee up our discussion today about how important it is. It really is, as we've suggested, a once in a lifetime opportunity. Have you ever had a once in a lifetime opportunity? Have you ever had maybe a chance to travel somewhere that you never thought you would be able to travel to? Maybe it's an opportunity to meet somebody that you never thought you would be able to meet. You know, I meet a lot of first generation college students, a lot of first generation technical and community college students, and they look at their education as a once in a lifetime opportunity. I think we've all had an opportunity at least once in our life that we could say it was once in a lifetime. Folks, I'm here to tell you today that especially in secondary education, especially in K-12 education, this is our once in a lifetime opportunity. As some of you know, I spent most of my career in manufacturing. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But most of my career in manufacturing, I came over to this world of technical education about six years ago. And I found a really, really close friend. He lives out on the East Coast. And he has been working on the business side of education for 45 years. When he talked about the amount of money that is coming into K-12 education, when he talked about the amount of money that our school districts will have available to them in the next couple of years, he used a word that has stuck with me, and it was almost a year ago, that has stuck with me every single day since I heard it. He said that the amount of money coming into technical education, coming into STEM education is staggering. Staggering means shocking. Staggering means astonishing. We have a shocking and astonishing amount of money coming into the world of technical education. And the question becomes, what do we do with this literally once in a lifetime opportunity? Some might say a once in a lifetime opportunity is winning the lottery. I would say in many ways, when we look at the amount of funding coming into tech ed, when we look at the amount of funding coming into education, that we, we have won the lottery. We have won, we have found that winning ticket, we have found that winning combination of numbers, and our numbers came up, and it's our day to turn that ticket in for a fortune. Would you believe, though, if you look at people who won the lottery, and maybe you've seen TV shows about this, maybe you've read articles about this, what percentage of people who win the lottery end up broke within five years. That number is staggering as well. Would you believe that it is 70% of people that win huge sums of money in the lottery end up without any of that money five years ago? And as we talk today about some of the things that worry me, one of the things that I worry about as we see the staggering amount of money coming into education is that rather than 
winning the lottery and putting that money to great use that we, like so many poor people who win the lottery, end up bankrupt. We end up broke. We end up spending that money on things that don't have long-term benefit. We don't think about the long-term opportunity of really thinking through how we can put this money to work in a way that benefits our students, and in a way that benefits our communities, and in a way that benefits literally the entire United States of America. As Melissa mentioned during her introduction, I get the pleasure, and it is indeed a pleasure and honor, to host the Tech Ed podcast every single week, where we talk with leaders like Mike Chico and people like Blake Moret, people who are making huge investments in their businesses around advancing technology, people who tell us what it is that they feel their school districts should be teaching, people who tell us what they want their employees to be learning. And would you believe that almost to a person, these folks tell us about the advancing technology taking place in their markets and how important it is for us to create an entire generation of talent around advancing technology. And it is important on so many levels as we're gonna talk about in just a moment. This is my friend, John Pfeiffer. John is the president and CEO of Oshkosh Corporation, a huge international defense contractor located in the Midwest. I want you to look at the second paragraph of what John told me when he was on our podcast. John said, every time we produce a product today, we expect that it will be connected. So we will be able to, or our owner or user will be able to get real-time insights because they are working with a connected vehicle. They are working with a connected machine. This whole idea of connectivity, this whole idea of smart technology, this whole idea of data analytics, this is absolutely pervading every single space in our economy. Certainly not just defense contractors, but every single space in our economy from agriculture to distribution, to logistics, to retail, to uh, agriculture, to hospitality, to healthcare, it doesn't matter what space you are in. This technology is totally changing your space. And this is really, really important to us. As I work with the Smart Automation Certification Alliance, an amazing international organization building certifications around advancing technology, talking to industrial employers, talking to employers of all times in the tech, all kinds in the technology space. What these folks tell us, they all tell us the same thing. Technology is totally changing their businesses and education needs to prepare a generation of students and learners, that next generation of our workforce for this advancing technology. Literally a once in a lifetime opportunity. So I spent years in industry 3.0 manufacturing. That was my job, was running industry 3.0 businesses in this world when automation and computers were just starting to be used in the world of manufacturing. We are in a totally different world in every segment of our economy today. And what employers are telling us is that our students need to be learning and understanding and building skills around technologies and competencies like these cyber physical systems, smart sensors and smart devices, augmented and virtual reality, mixed reality, the types of technologies that are gonna lead us into the metaverse. Digital twins, additive manufacturing, 3D printing, understanding how to scan a part, turning that scan into an STL file and 3D printing a part as a result of that. Cloud computing, computer programming, coding, this whole area of data science and data analytics, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. These are just some examples of the kinds of technologies that we must be introducing our students to as they go through their secondary education pathway. What do you wake up in the middle of the night and worry about when you've got some extra time on your hands and you're all alone and the room is a little dark and you have time just to think about things and just to worry about things? Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a child. There's all kinds of things that we can worry about. One of the things that I worry about when it's my time to worry is that our great country of the United States of America loses its ground in the world of technology. Like many of you, I get the opportunity to travel the globe and see how technology is advancing around the globe. I read the newspaper every single morning and I hear stories about hypersonic missiles and these crazy military systems and military satellites and business and technology satellites and all of these different technologies that are absolutely changing our world. They're advancing at lightning speed and in many ways 
creating a threat to our very way of life here in the United States. As we look at other technologies, as we look at other countries advancing in the world of technology, I worry that we're losing our space. I'm worried that we are losing our leadership position. I don't think we're there yet, but I think that that is at risk. So what we are talking about today is at the very heart of our national security. It's at the very heart of our well-being in the future. But I'll tell you one of the other things that I worry about, and I worry about this just a little bit, is that when I sit down with folks that are trying to figure out how do we spend this unprecedented amount of money? How do we spend this staggering amount of money that is coming in to education? I hear a lot of questions. I hear, I'll be honest with you, a lot of self-interest. And we're all self-interested to some degree, and I understand that. And if I'm a teacher, I probably want more money coming into teacher salaries. And if I'm an administrator, maybe I want to build a great big building. If I'm an athletic director, who wouldn't want an amazing football field with all of this awesome technology and skyboxes and, and jumbotrons and all this other these other things that we see literally going in to high school athletic departments? And who wouldn't want some of those things? And I'm not saying that that is bad, but the truth of the matter is that those things will pay us off for a period of time. We'll enjoy them for a period of time. The question is, are we investing in the future of our districts? Are we investing in curriculum and learning systems that will bring about the future for our students, that will provide opportunities for them as they enter whatever comes after high school, as they're going into the workforce? as they're going on to technical or community college, as they're going on to be the future engineers, if you will, on our four-year colleges, doing research and graduate programs and beyond. The very future of our country, the very future of our technology and the very future of our way of life rests in our ability to deliver the right kind of learning at the right time. What we are gonna talk about for the rest of this interview and for the rest of this webinar is how we do that is how we can take those ESSER funds and other funding coming into our programs and put it to maximum possible use, literally invested in the future of our students and the future of our communities and the future of our country. It's a pleasure for me to be with you today. I really appreciate, Melissa, the opportunity to join this great group of people as we vision out the future. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the webinar, webinar this afternoon. Thank you. And thank you, Matt. As always, Matt provides us tons of inspiration, gets us excited about the topic at hand. And now we're going to get into the weeds, into the details, and hopefully help demystify uh, ESSER funds because there's a lot going on and we hear a lot of questions. So we're going to help break it down for you all in the rest of our webinar this afternoon. So at this point, I'm going to bring on my colleague, Mike Dietrich. Mike is a former middle, uh, middle and high school teacher who is now working at ATS Lab Midwest. He heads up our K-12 team and he also heads up all of our instructor training efforts. Uh, Mike is going to help us understand what ESSER funds are and break it all down for us. So Mike, welcome and thanks for sharing your insights. Awesome. Thank you so much, Melissa. And I'm really excited to be here back on another webinar uh, with you and all of our guests. So uh, I just wanted to reiterate a couple of things that, that Matt touched on uh, in his introduction. And I also wanted to clarify that, you know, this webinar that we put together we wanted to make it as um, universal as possible. So when we kind of put it together this informational session, we wanted to make sure that we were supporting all of our administrators and giving them ideas and strategies and uh, you know give, have a good discussion on what you can use some of those ESSER funds for. Um, but then we also wanted to give uh, basically some tools and resources and just general awareness to our instructors, who I know many of you are assigned on right now, uh, to advocate for your program. Uh, because like Matt said, this is really an incredible time to um, boost, expand it uh, forward and advance your CTE program into so many cool different areas, all for the benefit of your students, uh, your community and your local industry partners. So um, when I go through breaking down the demystifying uh, of ESSER funds, um, some of this information might be uh, pretty familiar with all of our administrators who uh, receive this and they're kind of on the front end. But I, I have to admit, I still go around uh, the state and the rest of our territory and I run into folks who just have no idea what this is. They might have heard the acronym before, but they really don't have any idea what could be possible 
for their own programs. So I'm just going to spend a couple minutes uh, breaking down what are ESSER funds. And at a, at a very simple level, uh, they stand for the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Funds, or ESSER. Uh, we're actually in our third round of ESSER. Um, if you look, the, uh, the first round that came in uh, in 2020, that was the initial CARES Act when the pandemic first came about. Um, ESSER II uh, came uh, in 2021, early 2021. Similar to CARES Act, a little bit more um, uh, allowable uses for those funds. And then what we're going to be spending most of our time today is talking about ESSER III, which is under the uh, American Rescue Plan. Um, we're going to go into a little bit more depth on what the allowable uses of those funds are and how can we use those for our CTE program. Um, by the way, all three of these different ESSER fund, uh, funding sources um, have a time frame of two years to utilize and spend the funding from the, uh, when the, uh, they were first launched and announced. Um, so looking at the distribution of ESSER funds, really 90% of this federal money, 90% uh, of ESSER III uh, funds, they, a state must give to what we call a local education agency, or essentially your local school district. Um, the amount your district receives will vary from district to district and state by state. Um, but this is where you can go and reference your, your DPIs, your DOEs. Uh, there's lists out there that actually show exactly how much is allocated per school district um, for, for all three, ESSER 1, 2, and 3. So again, I know this is kind of old hat and all of our uh, administrators might be really familiar with this. Um, but just going forward, we want to make sure that our instructors are aware of, hey, this is what might be available for my program. Um, so the allowable uses of ESSER funds, the, the key thing with ESSER 3 is that at least 20% of those must go towards addressing uh, lost learning. So being able to put up a barrier against uh, future pandemics, but also um, repair and provide enrichment intervention to our students uh, from lost learning during the pandemic. So that can look like after school clubs and activities, summer enrichment programs and camps, extended year programs. Uh, sometimes it can be used for uh, specific learning technology to um, be able to uh, put forth a hybrid learning method. So, uh, or even support those students that are still in remote or in a virtual setting if they opt out. So that's where we get in that at least 20% needs to be devoted to that. The, the neat thing about ESSER 3 though, is that the remaining 80%, um, that can go toward a wide range of activities. Um, activities that are already authorized under um, legislation like the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, um, IDEA for all of our students with uh, students with disabilities, um, the Adult Education and Family Literacy Act, and probably the most pertinent one to this webinar is the Carl D. Perkins Career and Technical Education Act. So I know my instructors and my CTE directors are very familiar um, with this piece of the legislation. It's a huge funding source uh, for our CTE programs, um, but we're gonna spend a little bit more time on how we can make the case for our CTE programs under ESSER 3. Um, by the way, you can actually go and look, there are 13 additional allowable uses for ESSER 3 um, that you can look under that federal legislation. But today we're gonna to talk about CTE. So how do we make the case for our CTE programs? Uh, really, ESSER funds are designed to help districts recover from the pandemic and prevent future disruptions to student learning. Um, I'm pretty sure I, all of my instructors out there can agree that they were significantly impacted by the pandemic, especially when we're working with hands-on kinesthetic learners. Um, the dreaded screen that you see of trying to teach welding, CNC fabrication, automation, uh, working with our hands and tools kind of doesn't really work that well when we're all staring uh, at a Zoom screen. So yes, CTE programs were impacted. Um, even as we started to move more into hybrid models where you had some students on an A or a B day or some students who were teaching or instructors who were teaching both virtually and in person at the same time, it was a huge, huge impact. So yes, CTE programs absolutely fall under uh, those ESSER 3 allocations. Um, the other thing I'll say about working with our CTE programs is that CTE is the backbone of our industrial workforce, and it's vital to prepare young talent for future careers. And if I, again, I'll ask my instructors, my administrators, all my educators out there, imagine what it was like 
at the height of pandemic or even just over the past year, getting into a site visit, being able to go and do uh, set up a youth apprenticeship or co-op program. Our manufacturers, our industrial partners were absolutely impacted uh, by the pandemic and we need to adapt to that. Um, our manufacturers are adapting to that. There's a, there's a case study that came out from uh, the Google Cloud Institute. They actually found that 77% of manufacturers worldwide say that COVID-19 is going to impact their future operations and how they function as a company. Um, even more than three out of four companies, they say they're gonna start implementing uh, digital enablers, disruptive technology, automation, providing clean spaces. Long gone are the days where we have uh, 20 people, 20 assembly uh, manufacturing uh, production workers working on the same line. There's going to be more of this really advanced technology to adapt for future disruptions. Uh, and if we go back to Perkins, let's remember the whole idea of Perkins 5, uh, when we get access to that federal funding, it's all about aligning to industrial relevant skills and technology, providing credentials, cert certifications and associate degrees, and preparing students in current or emerging profession for current and emerging pr professions. And education needs to adapt to that. If our industry partners are going to adapt and move forward with Industry 4.0 technology, we absolutely need to follow that up. And that's where ESSER 3 funding can really support your program in making that shift, extending that learning and exposing your students to, to those really awesome new technologies and new careers. So that's kind of my short course in just explaining a little bit more about uh, demis or a little bit more about ESSER 3 funds uh, for those of our uh, instructors or other educators who might not be as familiar with it. But now I wanna give uh, introduce one of my uh, education partners. I want to introduce a case study where we actually can look at what a school district did in order to, uh, you know, identify, uh, evaluate the usage of those ESSER funds and actually work with their industry partners and other really neat funding sources to, you know, advance their CTE program. So I'd like to introduce uh, one, Dr. Kobe Fletcher, who's the superintendent of Escanaba Area Public Schools. And I also have on, you know, I have Darcy Stenfords, who's the principal at uh, Escanaba, uh, Escanaba Area Public Schools. So Kobe and Darcy, thank you so much for being here. You bet. Thanks, Mike. Awesome. All right, so just kind of looking forward, looking back at to what your, uh, what your district did when you were kind of thinking about how can we utilize these ESSER funds um, how is your district currently using that funding source to enhance your CTE program? You know, we look at a couple of different things. Um, you know, one, uh, we saw an opportunity here to do something that we weren't currently doing. Uh, and so as that opportunity became available, we also were fortunate that we had ESSER funding that became available to us at the same time. So it was sort of as if the stars aligned. Uh, and when we went this direction, uh, we were dealing actually with ESSER two funds. Uh, and if you're dealing with ESSER three funds, you've got even more flexibility than we had when we were dealing with ESSER two funds. Uh, but when we looked at that funding uh, and we looked at allowable uses for ESSER two, one of the things that ESSER two allows you to look at is dealing with learning loss. And then under that category, you can also deal with evidence-based activities that meet the comprehensive needs of students. And so when we looked at STEM education in particular, uh, we felt like that was, uh, you know, number one, a great way to start to tackle learning loss uh, in, in a hands-on application sort of way. Uh, and then number two, uh, you've mentioned a lot of the opportunities that are available to students through STEM programming. Uh, and we felt like we could make the case that that helped meet their comprehensive needs. Uh, and so we were actually able to use the ESSER II funding to bring on uh, a significant portion of the STEM education that we're offering right now. Yeah, that's fantastic. So you're, you're up in the Upper Peninsula. I know there's a lot of industry in that area. Sometimes one of the issues is, is just awareness for students. But let, let me ask you this. How did you come to that decision that you wanted to identify these certain pathways uh, to promote, um, you know, different careers to your students? 
So here at our junior senior high school, uh, we had a traditional wood shop class. And this was a fantastic class, hands-on learning that we had an instructor that worked with for many years and that, that instructor retired. And so we saw that as an opportunity to make a move in a direction that we felt would um, that students would value and that they would benefit from. And so we looked to convert that wood shop into a type of industrial tech or manufacturing lab in hopes that we would help meet some of the needs they had in preparation for their work like post-secondary. So if they were going into a trades field or onto a, a university or um, even a community college. And so it was going to help our students be better prepared for that workforce. And we have such a, a need in our local community with our manufacturers to help prepare our students for those spots. Um, they have many openings. And so, you know, we would be doing a disservice to our students if we didn't prepare them in the best manner we could. We could. So um, we just saw this as a, a big need. So we made the decision to to basically translate our, our wood shop into this beautiful manufacturing lab that will get our students ready for their careers. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. I mean, you've got, uh, got to kind of follow the needs of your community, the needs of your industry partners. I've actually had the privilege of uh, speaking with someone, got great automation companies up there, um, great uh, engineering and integrators, uh, even some plastics uh, organizations there in the area. So there's lots of great industry and it's really all about just providing that pathway. So um, again, you kind of jumped in at a very uh, uh, opportune time to take on an initiative like this. Um, how did you involve some of your strategic partners or your school board or even your industry partners um, to kind of get them to give you the, the green light to move forward with this initiative? Well, once, once we made the decision to, to do this um, program and to really start this, this transfer from a traditional setting to something new and exciting, um, there, are, there were many locals that we were able to work with. We have um, the benefit of having our intermediate school district, which has a career technical program located just across the parking lot from us. So we have as many as 200 to 250 students every day who transfer across that parking lot to get involved in career technical programs. Uh, we also have a local community college, six, you know, just uh, not even six miles, four miles up the road. And uh, they've been a great partner that we have worked with um, when we developed our early middle college program it allowed us to work with those college partners in getting our students on pathways in which we could um, you know, provide them a free year of school, get them better prepared for programs. And our, our career tech center behind us also has an early middle college program that helps students in the industrial tracks that are getting prepared for careers in machining and manufacturing and industries. So you know, it really allowed us to work with like our local CTE center, our local college, um, through our early middle college programs and preparing kids to move on to university level. So it just, you know, and, and then ultimately into manufacturers in the area. So we had so many partners just chomping at the bit, ready to, to collaborate together and to make this happen. Yeah, I, I love how you were able to leverage, you know, who specialized, you know, if your tech center specialized in these areas, but you still had students who were going up to Michigan Tech or were going to the local community college. I like that you were able to leverage the resources that you have and provide something totally new and exciting to your students, but is still going to contribute to the pipeline. So exactly. that's fantastic. Um, so let, let me ask you this. How are you using ESSER funds to creatively win additional money in support of the same initiative? Because I've heard some additional um, stories where you can utilize those funds to also you know, apply for other grant opportunities. So what have you seen in your area? Yeah, this is one of those times the stars aligned, right? The ESSER funds became available, but we also have uh, a, a talent consortium in the Upper Peninsula that is centered around manufacturing. And they receive quite a bit of money from the state to provide grants to not just schools, but really any type of organization that's gonna support manufacturing in the region. And when we started looking at these programs, we realized that it would be a perfect fit for a manufacturing consortium grant, uh, which requires a certain match. Uh, and so you can imagine that, well, all right, we had ESSER funds that we could use to make these purchases. Uh, they could be matching funds for another grant that we might be eligible for. 
And so we applied for that grant. They were aware that, you know, we were going to be able to provide the matching funds. And to be honest with you, combining those two funding sources, one of the things that it allowed us to do was to really create from the outset a fully functional manufacturing lab, uh, something that could take the kids from A to Z just right off the bat. Uh, and so we kind of creatively wove that funding together. We made the application for the grant. And then we also wrote this into our ESSER funding. Uh, both were approved and in short order, uh, we had the lab up and running. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. You know, and I've, I've written enough grants before where, you know, if you start, you know, leveraging the community and industrial needs and all the different education and manufacturing companies and partners and, you know, creating a continuum with a plan. Yeah, that's that's going to win every single time. So it's just a fantastic story to, to hear from both of you and especially in, in your area to promote this type of learning. So um, Darcy and Kobe, I can't thank you enough for sharing your experience and, and some of your strategies. I think you definitely gave um, some food for thought for all of our attendees to think about, you know, how can they leverage their partnerships, leverage additional funding resources and, you know, advance and promote their program. So thank you so much for being here. I wish you all the best and we'll see you all soon. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Uh, we're gonna focus now on actually providing some ideas on what can we use ESSER funds for? And when we, when we thought about this, we wanted to make sure we were fitting in with the 20% uh, the and the 80% of different uh, strategies that you can utilize uh, when you're accessing this funding. I think you heard some great strategies and uh, some different examples from uh, Darcy and, and Kobe, but we're gonna build on that. We're gonna give our, uh, our audience today five ideas for using ESSER funds in your CTE program. So first one I want to focus on is uh, kind of an easy one that fits honestly in both that 80 and 20% is it's actually a great opportunity to start summer camps and after school clubs. So things like um, eSports pathway, uh, students or working with a STEM camp at the younger level so that you can build that promotion into um, your high school and, and K-12 or your higher, higher ed programs. Uh, the money is available to launch these programs and build engagement and get more kids excited about what you're doing uh, at your CTE program at the high school and beyond. So strategy number one, tons of available resources to start summer camps and after school clubs. Um, number two, again, kind of fitting in with that, uh, not just uh, uh, recovering from lost learning, but also preventing future lost learning. There's definitely an opportunity to invest in uh, e-learning district-wide. Um, I've even heard long are the days uh, Days are gone with uh, snow days where now we can actually, even when students aren't at school, we can still deliver um, some pretty awesome learning. So investing in more interactive and, and engaging resources than just a Zoom lecture, um, provide students the opportunity to learn in their own space and at their own time. Uh, you can even utilize that same e-learning within the classroom. So you can do flexible pod rotations and not have to buy a, a class set of just one piece of equipment. So you can also utilize virtual trainers and simulators. Um, and then of course, a lot of times these uh, e-learning district wide site license, they work across a lot of different grade levels. So one license can be utilized from kindergarten all the way up through the 12th grade um, and really build some awesome engagement with all your students. So idea number two, definitely take a look at some of those e-learning opportunities that are out there. Um, number three, this one kind of fits a little bit more in line with our, uh, um, with our industry partners is um, update your labs with clean high-tech training systems. Um, industry standards is moving into more automation. They're, doing, uh, they're not gonna have a whole line of people working in a crowded work cell. Um, portable options are also great for hybrid learning. If, you can, if students can check out pieces of equipment so that they can work on hands-on skills at home, they can also bring that back into the classroom and move on to the next uh, to the next level. So we're seeing a lot of uh, movement in terms of how do I make my CTE space not just be dark, dirty, and dangerous, but be well lit, clean, and have really cool and exciting technology to get kids excited about uh, these current and future careers. Um, another one, and this uh, idea kind of goes without saying, but there's a lot of opportunities to build alignment uh, to industry needs. So, you know, working with your advisory boards and let's work together and identify 
what are some certifications that uh, they're looking for and can we provide additional curriculum and resources to meet those certifications? Um, can we uh, provide a little bit more infrastructure to build out um, youth co-op programs or youth apprenticeship programs? Um, and we can even you know, use some of those funds to provide more for guest speakers, site visits, some of those hands-on learning opportunities. Um, just think about all the possibilities of how can you better engage with your industry partners? One with preparing the skills and the uh, tools that they need to be successful to work in their potentially in their facility or in their industry. But then two, also how can you promote what they do by providing some of that exciting new technology in your own classroom space? And of course, the last one, number five, this one's kind of near and dear to my heart, but tons and tons of, of uh, funds available for teacher training and support. So there's a wide range of opportunities to develop in professional development, help onboard new instructors uh, to send them off to training or to be able to host on-site training at your, uh, at your facility. Um, you can even utilize it to bring in industry experts to help. Um, and again, to continue to build that engagement. So again, these are just five different ideas that you can use ESSER funds uh, for your CTE program. And really what we wanna make sure we're doing is we're, we're advancing our program forward, we're building that industry alignment and we're supporting our teachers with the curriculum and tools and resources that they need. So now I'm gonna kick it back over to Melissa who's gonna move on with our, uh, our next guest for today. And I'll see you all again real soon. Thanks, Mike. Dr. Mike Trimberger is the superintendent at the school district of Random Lake in Wisconsin. So um, Mike has actually been actively involved in the entire application process, planning, budgeting, funding allocation for his district's ESSER funds. So he took some time to share with us kind of the, the best practices and the tips that he kind of figured out as he and his business manager were navigating the Wisconsin DPI's website, understanding the state specific specifications, deadlines, resources, information that were shared. Again, as Mike mentioned earlier, every state is going to be different with their timelines and um, their processes and what resources they have available to their educators. Mike is going to get to um, in just a little bit, sharing how you can find out that information for yourself. But for all of our Wisconsin educators on, this is going to be really useful for you. And if you're not uh, located in Wisconsin, I think this is a great kind of case study to understand what it takes to navigate these websites, these resources, and understand how you can go about al allocating your funding um, for your school. Awesome. Well, thank you, Melissa. As anyone in education knows, it's kind of crazy times. Um, but uh, when when I was asked to share what we're doing with this, it's very timely. Actually, as soon as I'm done here, I'm working on my Esther 3 plan. So hopefully what I'm finding out here can help some uh, some of you as, as we figure out how the federal government's going to make our jobs even harder. But at least there's funds that come with this. So um, as you can see, I have on my screen right now, and I've really been uh, uh, using this ESSER 3 page on DPI. Uh, we can have a link for this if you're looking for it, but this video it has been very impactful. Uh, I'm the superintendent of a small district, about 700 students. So being a superintendent with a, in a small sandbox, I get to do stuff like this and uh, I get to learn as I go. So um, after watching the video, uh, some of the things that uh, that I think are very helpful on this page are uh, I know there's a wide range of individuals that are watching this. Uh, the allocations, I'm, I'm sure, sure the superintendents and, and uh, the business managers know what your allocations are, but this link right here will share all of the allocations for all districts. Uh, that number has changed a few times, uh, but this one was last updated in January and we're pretty confident that's going to be uh, the number or close to the number of what uh, we're gonna get. Um, if you don't know, we have a very important date coming up. Uh, our general uh, applications are due uh, on in March, and um, I believe March 11th is the date that we're working on right now. And, and I can tell you, in Random Lake, uh, we are keeping it very general. Uh, we have really three big pots of money that we're going to be using it. In, in Random Lake, we have just over a half million dollars. Uh, we're going to be using about about a hundred thousand of it for the next three years in our summer school program. Uh, we're going to be using another about uh, three hundred thousand dollars for research-based equipment and curriculum, and then another hundred thousand for staffing. So, 
Um, but you know, one of the questions here is what can you use ESSER funds for? And if you go to this site, uh, one of the places my business manager and I have been talking aloud is, is this tab right here so, uh, that has allowable activities and costs. Um, there's a really great Google document right here, uh, chart comparing the usage of funds for all three ESSER programs. Uh, in general, they say whatever you spent on ESSER 1 and 2, you can on 3. That's a pretty close to being right. Uh, there are some exceptions. But as I look through here and, and talk, especially through the lens of um, technology, uh, you know, in, currently in, in Random Lake, we use um, uh, we use LJ Crate and some other, other curriculum for, for teaching technology. And if we had to purchase more, what I would do is use the purchasing educational technology right here. Uh, you don't have to get real definitive on what it is. Uh, you can just put down, we are going to do X amount in purchasing educational technology. And from there, you can, can over the next two years, decide how you're going to do it. Like I said, in Random Lake, we just have th two, three big buckets that we're going to use. And then um, we're going to define that further as we go down the road. So uh, looking in here also, if you're looking at any curriculum to go with the technology, uh, ESSER 3 is allowable for any kind of technology. There's a lot about learning loss. And as we look at ways to really connect our secondary students to careers and how they've lost some of those experiences over the last two years, um, a lot of the funds in ESSER are right there. You know, ESSER 3 does allow, allow for staffing. So if you really want to have a focus on technology education, or if you're looking for different kinds of skills, you know, those career ready skills, um, ESSER 3 does allow for staffing. And, and sometimes, you know, in, in districts, we're so strapped with just human capital. If you can use some of this to give a, uh, a tech ed teacher an overload, or if you can find a community member that can come in and teach a class, that is allowable. And, and sometimes we can look at our community to help us teach some of these skills um, and, and pay them for doing it. So uh, that, that's the nice thing about it. We are using it for staffing in Random Lake. And, and sometimes we have our, our, our staff are so overloaded right now to add something else would be really tough. Well, maybe you can use some of these funds to, to help bring somebody in to, to be a consultant, be a teacher, be a um, somebody that, that's you know, currently doing this in the community that uh, wants to connect with kids. You know, one of the best things you can do is show that this is a community need. You know, in Random Lake, we're talking to our companies on a regular basis. Um, our instructors are, are embedded into our local manufacturing and, and talking to them. And, and nothing is, uh, nothing's easier for a superintendent to say yes then and saying, hey, as a teacher, I feel this. And, you know, the, the president of this company thinks this or the HR director is looking at this. If you can show that this really can connect what, what you're trying to do in the school to what the community needs uh, for employees, that, that makes it a really, really easy yes. I love everything that uh, Mike had to say. He shared some great insights and it kind of brings it back full circle. What he was saying at the end was if you can show the community impact, the positive community impact that, that this is going to have, not just for the students, but also for the local economy, the local workforce, kind of rebuild those pathways into the emerging fields that have come about as a result of the pandemic. I mean, this is just a great way to advocate for your CTE program and why we need to be funneling ESSER funds in support of our CTE programs and instructors. So we appreciate Mike's thoughts. And I just wanted to reiterate one thing that Mike said, you don't have to know 100% what you're going to be spending it on as long as you allocate the funds um, and classify them at however you need to classify them. You just need to delineate where those go. And then you have those two years to kind of figure out the rest of your plans. Um, speaking of figuring out the rest of your plans, as we've mentioned a couple of times, it's a little bit different state by state. Mike, like I said, is working out of Wisconsin. So that's kind of what Wisconsin looks like with the DPI's website. Um, but Mike Dietrich is going to share a little bit more tips and tricks about what you can do to help find all of the details for your own individual state. So Mike, back to you. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, we've been saying it all, all uh, afternoon that um, each state is a little bit different and we want to be able to give kind of what's the clear, easy way to figure out step by step 
um, where are my resources at, but also kind of figuring out where are things at in terms of the status and availability of funding. Um, so again, if you're familiar with your own state's education website, please absolutely go directly to your DPI, your DOE. Um, they're making that pretty easy to identify. Um, but one of the things that I like uh, with, you know, within the five steps that I'm going to sh share with you right now is you can actually see where your status is at a federal level. So we're going to really start at that 30,000 feet and kind of work our way down. Um, so to find out what's happening in your state, step one, we recommend going to the, uh, the actually the Federal Department of Education uh, office, the Federal Office of Elementary and Secondary Education website. And there actually is an AR, uh, American Rescue Plan, ESSER State Plan and Status. So we have a, a link right here, which you can quick copy down, tinyurl.com, tiny and then the sequence of numbers and letters there. But then you can see if you go and look at the actual um, uh, federal website, uh, we're really going and finding the American Rescue Plan, American Rescue Plan, the ESSER funds, and then finding the state plan. So that's step one, is going to that federal website and finding that resource. From there, you're gonna see a whole list of every single state. And we're gonna use Nebraska as an example. So what we, what we recommend doing is scroll down, find your state. Um, you can see what the whole state is being allocated, which might not be as, uh, might not be as helpful on an individual school district level. Um, but if you keep looking, you'll see you have, Nebraska has an approved uh, ESSER state plan for the ARP, they have an approval letter. Uh, from uh, the uh, Secretary of Education. There's a press release, their highlights. And then also over here, we typically see something that's a link. And that'll be a link that takes you directly back to your ESSER landing page at your own state uh, DPI or DOE website. Now, the one caveat to this is some of these uh, status updates here, they might say pending, they might have an Excel doc. That's okay. Uh, most of the time, from my experience, anything that's pending, it's just like they're tweaking a couple of little things that they need to uh, adjust in their in the state's proposal to the federal government. So don't be worried if your state says pending, you can still navigate to your own uh, Department of Education website. Um, but this is a good way to see like, hey, is my plan approved? Am I ready to go? Is everything 100% ready for the application process? Um, and then it'll take you to that landing page. Um, step three, when you get to that landing page, you're gonna see a wealth of resources and a lot of them are tailored and customized directly to your state. So if you look while on your state's Department of Education website, find the master list of ESSER fund allocations. Mike Trimberger showed you where ours was. It was one of the first things that they had updated. Uh, if you look on the Nebraska site, you could see one of the first drop down menus is LEA allocations for K-12 public school districts. And they also right behind it, allowable uses, uh, funds for LEAs, and then what I really like about the individual state uh, websites is they provide custom and tailored documents. And this is a really important uh, thing to find because we're gonna need to compare our state plan with the general federal legislation. And that's actually step four. Compare the federal guidelines, the federal funding allowance guidelines to what your own state is doing. So for example, Nebraska had a framework for uh, a, a document titled Nebraska's Framework for School Renewal and Acceleration. And they highlighted about 15 different areas that they really wanted to focus on as they're using those ESSER, ESSER funds. And that's really important to know because the only way that funding was approved from the federal government was because of the state plan that they put forth. Um, you'll see a lot of similarities from state to state, but I've, I've worked in worked with some of our education partners where they have a STEM innovation initiative and that's where they're kind of funneling through a lot of ESSER funds. Um, I'll, we'll make a couple more notes of what Nebraska is doing, but it, it really is clear that they have a tailored plan to what uh, they want to use those ESSER funds for and they're gonna be held to it so that they can continue to give access and distribute those funds uh, to their school districts. All right, and then the last step is a really important piece is Find your state's ESSER three application process and requirements to access those funds. Um, so typically that's another drop down menu that you'll see uh, where it actually has the application. It'll have the deadline uh, that's in place. And what it'll also probably have is again, some more areas of focus. Um, 
you know, the Nebraska Department of Education, five investment priorities are listed right as people are going to fill out those LEA applications for the use of funds. Uh, so again, you know, these five steps to figure out where to go to learn what's happening in your state, they're very broad. But what I like is it gives you a status update and it really points you into some really customized, tailored uh, guides and instructions and priorities that'll just help you build your own plan uh, even better and get access to all that great funding. Um, that's all from me right now. But um, again, if you have any questions about some of these processes, I, I know Melissa is, uh, is sharing with you all to reach out to info at labmidwest.com. And we'd be happy to connect you with a, a team member and help you figure out what's happening in your state and support you going forward. Back over to you, Melissa. Wonderful. Thank you, Mike. Um, we have thrown a lot at you guys. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for sitting with us through these 60 minutes um, of information and some hopefully some inspiration as well. Now, because we threw a lot at you, there were several links in the presentation, some things you might want to follow up on or reread. Like I said, we will be sending you the recording. We will also be sending you PDF versions of some of these resources so that you can directly click, click through them, download them, read them later, print them off, share them with others, because we want to give you all the tools that you need to be successful. Now, we I won't say that we are, you know, um, ESSER experts in, in terms of all of the litigation and all of the rules. And you should probably talk to, you know, whoever you're working with on the finance side or on the law side for, for some of those nitty gritty details. But we are career and technical education experts and we are STEM experts and we are curriculum experts. So when you're thinking about how you can utilize some of these funding opportunities for your programs, please do talk to us. We are more than willing to consult with you, to share ideas, to share some of the stuff that um, we found to be successful in other districts. Um, we know industry really, really well. We can tell you what's happening in industry and how you can connect um, your plans and your innovations to what's happening in industry to make the most for your students. We also do, I know ESSER is for K-12 districts, but we work very closely with higher education, both at the technical and community college level and at the university level. And if you're looking to make more connections, more pathways, from your high school into those post-secondary uh, partners, we are more than willing to help share ideas and to make those connections for you. So again, as Mike mentioned, email us at info at labmidwest.com. We're happy to share curriculum resources, ideas, consultation, what have you. Um, our website is labmidwest.com. Mike and his team, they are the K-12 experts and they're just incredible people to work with. As you can see, we just have some incredible school districts that we have the, the pleasure of working with. We want to thank them again for being on with us today. Um, hopefully together, everybody in attendance, everybody um, who is working in K-12 education, I know it's been a difficult few years. There's opportunities ahead. There's light at the end of the tunnel. There's just a once in a lifetime opportunity, as we've said before, and I'll say it again, um, just to secure the American dream for the next generation of STEM and workforce talent. We have that opportunity to do it, so let's do it together. Thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your week.